Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the most gracious the ever merciful Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen all praise is due to Allah the Lord of all things Wal Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen and the good result is in favor of the pious Wala Udwana illa ala Zalimin Wala Hawla Wala Kuwata illa Billahil Ali al Alim and there is no power or ability except through Al Ali, the most lofty, Al Alim, the great one, was salatu was salamu ala Imam al Muttaqeen. And may Allah raise the rank of and grant peace to the leader of all of the pious, Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, our Prophet Muhammad, and likewise all of his family and companions, Amma Ba'ad, as for what follows. On this evening, preceding the 13th of Sha'ban, the 8th month of the year 1439, we gather here at Al Masjid Al Awwal in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to continue our new series, our crash course on the fiqh of fasting in Ramadan, in preparation for this great month in front of us in two weeks and some time, insha'Allah ta'ala. Nas'al Allah ta'ala and yuballighana Ramadan bi sihhati wal afiyah. We ask Allah to grant us success in reaching Ramadan in safety and in good health. We pick up where we left off in our last class with the issue of how does Ramadan begin and how does Ramadan end? How do we consider the beginning of the month? With what do we consider the beginning of the month and the end of the month? Allah Ta'ala has said, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Whoever of you sees the shahr, how do you see the shahr, the month? You see the? The crescent moon, the very beginning of the light that comes off of the underside of the moon at the beginning of the month, which marks the first day of a new month, a new lunar month, a new Islamic month. And again, the months in Islam, they are with Allah Ta'ala 12 in number, and they are part of our religion. It is not an Arab calendar. It is not an alternative calendar even. It's our primary calendar that we live upon as Muslims. It is that the first month is, what's the name of the first month in Islam? Al-Muharram. The second month is? Safar. The third month? Rabi'a. We have two Rabi'a months. Rabi'a al-awwal and Rabi'a al-thani. Or al-akhar. The other Rabi'a. Then we have two Jumada months, numbers five and six. Jumada al ula and Jumada al-Thaniya or al akhirah the other Jumada. Those are the first six months. For the rest of the year, it should be pretty easy. Month number seven is Rajab, sacred month. Month number eight, Sha'ban, the month before Ramadan. Remember, Ramadan is preceded by a sheen and followed up by a sheen. Sha'ban and Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal. Remember the fasting of Sha'ban and the fasting of Shawwal, the months where you do supererogatory fasting, optional fasting, like how you pray sunnahs before your dhuhr prayer and sunnahs after your dhuhr prayer. You approach your obligation with nawafil, with optional deeds before it and after it. Amazing. Tayyip, so then you have Sha'ban. Ramadan, Shawwal, 8, 9, and 10. Then you have the two months with Dhu. The name Dhu. Dhu, Dhul Qa'da, the 11th month, and Dhul Hijjah, the 12th month. These months have our acts of worship connected to them. There's no worship connected to December or June or April. The worship of a Muslim is connected to these times. And our pillar of the religion fasting is connected to the 9th month of our calendar. So again, every... American, every Western person, he has to double his effort to connect himself to this calendar. Because it is not just an alternative calendar or a good calendar or a choice or something. Allah Ta'ala is only worshipped with this calendar. And may Allah Ta'ala give us success. So Ramadan begins with the end of Sha'ban. What marks the end of Sha'ban and the beginning of Ramadan? Our brother said, seeing the moon. There's a second way that the month ends and the new one begins? If you don't see the moon, if you don't see the moon then what? Count the then count out the days. Listen to this hadith Abu Mustafa, Abu Abdullah, 
sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered us to begin fasting with the ru'ya with the witnessing of the eye of the new month and he told us to break your fast meaning at the end of the month with the ru'ya with seeing the crescent then he gave us for this state of confusion that some people are in well, what do you do when you're not sure and there are calculations and people are saying it can be seen but we can't see it fa in ghumma alaykum in one narration of the hadith fa in ghubbiya alaykum if it's obscured from your view you have an order of what to do fa akmilu iddat sha'ban 30 then complete the number of days of sha'ban as 30 that's all the deen of Allah Ta'ala is easy. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرُ Allah wants ease for you and He does not want difficulty for you. Once you begin entering the world of we're going to build acts of worship upon predictions by astronomers and scientists, what are you going to do as a common person when they disagree? What are you going to do when they disagree? And some of them say, no, it won't be seen. And some of them say, yes, it will be seen. Some of them say it will be seen in this part of the country, but not the other part. And they start differing amongst themselves. What are you going to do? You have a religion that's easy. If you see the moon, and if you have a witness that has told you that's reliable that he has seen the moon, the entrance of the month is established by one single witness, one single reliable witness, then you start fasting. Because you are addressed by Allah Ta'ala, فَمَنْ شَاهِدَ مِنْكُمْ أَشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ Whoever of you sees the moon, the month, then let him fast it. You begin your fast. If you don't, then you rely upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who told you, فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُوا عِدَّةَ شَعْبَانَ الثَّلَثِينَ Then when it is obscured from your view, يَوْمُ الْغَيْمِ it's called, the day of doubt, the day of, uh, of obscurity. It's also called يَوْمُ الشَّكْ, the day of doubt. That is the 29th when you're looking for the moon to see if tomorrow will be the 30th of the month or the first of the next month. It's called Yom Al-Ghaim if it's cloudy. Yeah? If it's clear you see the crescent, it's not Ghaim. If it's cloudy, it's called the day of cloudiness or obscurity. It was the case that some of the people fasted on that day out of concern if it would be Ramadan Maybe the crescent is born up there and it's beyond the clouds and we can't see it, but it's really there. And they began to fast. Ammar ibn Yasir, radiyallahu anhu, said about those who would do such an action, he said, مَنْ صَامَ الْيَوْمَ الَّذِي يَشُكُّ فِيهِ النَّاسِ فَقَدْ عَصَى أَبَا القاسم. Whoever fasts on the day that the people doubt about, the 30th when it's cloudy, then he has disobeyed Abu al-Qasim. Why Abu al-Qasim is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's our prophet. What's the disobedience? He said, sumu li ru'yatihi. Fast when you see it. Fast according to its sighting. Wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. And break your fast according to its sighting. Fa in ghubbiya alaykum. Fa in ghumma alaykum. With these wordings, if it is obscured from your view, you have something you can do. Fa akmilu iddata sha'bana thalathina Yawman or 13. Then complete the number of days of Sha'ban as 30. Then it is an incorrect ijtihad to fast that day of doubt out of tahari or out of concern or out of caution. No, the worship of Allah Ta'ala is established from the permission of Allah Ta'ala and from the order of Allah Ta'ala and not from dhaniyat and not from assumptions or worries or concerns. We build our ibadat we build our worship upon certainty and upon clarity in knowledge and Islamic rulings that are firmly established. The scholars of Al-Islam, considering the way the Prophet ﷺ interacted with the witnesses and how the month would enter and end, they said as an observation based on istiqara, looking at all of the texts together, they said Ramadan can enter with the witness of a single reliable witness. But Ramadan ends and Shawwal enters with two witnesses. Why exactly? Allahu A'lam. Allah knows best. But this was noticed from the interactions of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa that he allowed the witness of a single companion, 
for the beginning of the month of Ramadan, but his general practice for the beginning of the month was two witnesses would be required. So one single reliable witness who has seen the moon, his testimony is accepted and the month is announced. Two witnesses for the end of the month though, at least two. Yeah, Anything more than that is easy, but one as a minimum for the beginning of the month and two as a minimum for the end of the month. There are times that a person will be an honest man and he's seen the crescent and he's the only one who's seen it and he reports it to the Muslim authorities but they don't accept it from him. Yeah? So they say, we don't believe you saw the moon. Whatever, their interview has led them to believe that since he's alone, it's very strange that he's the only one out of millions of people. And on top of that, we're just not confident in him for whatever reason. So they don't accept it. And they don't announce that the next day is Ramadan. What does that man do? What do you say, Abba Safiya? He fasts. He fasts privately. Why does he fast privately? So as not to disrupt the, the society. So as not to tell the people, I saw the moon, I don't care what the rulers say. Right? This is Ramadan and they're lying to you. He could come to them and, and create a huge fitness. So he, in this case, he has done what was upon him. He came to the authorities and reported it. For whatever reason, they didn't take his witness and they didn't act upon it. He knows it's Ramadan because he's seen it. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ That order remains upon him. Whoever has seen the crescent, then let him fast it. The month of the, the crescent of the month, then let him fast it. That order remains upon him and he fasts. But he does so without disrupting the harmony of the society. The other people are not responsible for fasting because they have not had the authorities introduce them to a witness that is acceptable, nor have they seen the, the moon themselves. So they're excused. And he himself has to be patient. There are times when a person may know something like that and he is patient and he resists the, you know, the urge or the, the feeling that he needs to tell everyone because of the clashing and the disruption that it would cause in the society. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. And so the month begins with what? A single witness. It ends with two witnesses. Barakallahu feekum. Or the counting out of 30 days. Or the counting out of 30 days. For your research and your own interests, I invite you to look up an issue called the 28-day month. Does it exist? How does it exist? And when does it exist? The 28-day month. The Prophet ﷺ said, hakada. The month is like this, and he made a gesture of 30, 30 days. And was shahru hakada, and he made a gesture of 29, 29 or 30 days for the month. So what's this thing about a 28-day month? A very rare thing. I say it's for your research and for you to look into. We don't want to go off into that topic. Barakallahu feekum. Tayyib. Then our next issue is the issue of beginning the fast at any time of the day or fasting from the time of dawn, from the entrance of dawn, when the first light of dawn enters, beginning the fast at that time. What's the issue come up for? What's the reason the issue comes up for? Because of the hadith, the narration that our beloved elder mentioned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, دَخَلَ عَلَيَّ النَّبِي sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet, may Allah raise his rank and grant him peace, came to me. ذات يوم one day فقال هل عندكم من شيء And he said, is there anything? And he meant what? Food. Is there anything? فَقُلْنَا la. So we said no. Was this a strange thing in the house of the Prophet? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not a strange thing. We would go one month to the next month to the next month and all we would have were the two black things. What were the two black things? Dates and Hamidullah. Water, barakallahu feekum. Dates and water. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a humble man distributing the charity and the war booty while he himself at times would have very little to nothing in his own house. Allahu Akbar, Allahumma salli wa sallam. وَبَارَكَ عَلَيْهِ So he would ask, do we have anything? She would say, no. فَإِنِّي إِذَنْ صَائِمٌ Then I am in that case fasting. Meaning at this time, I will make my intention to fast. And it was already partially through the day. This, as the scholars comment, 
is for optional fasts. And an optional fast here is a purely optional fast, not something mistakenly understood as an optional fast. What do I mean by that? Some people consider making up a day from Ramadan as an optional day because of an element of an option in it. What's the angle of making up a day from Ramadan being optional? Picking the day that you're going to do the fast. So when you're making up a day from Ramadan, you have to make a day up. Okay, tomorrow, or the next day, or next week, or, you know, any time in the near future. These are options. So you're allowed to choose when you're going to make that up. So your obligation of making up a day of fasting has an element of an option with it. But just because you've chose Tuesday and not Monday to make up the fast, doesn't mean you can come now and cancel it in the middle of the day and say, I'm not going to fast now because it's an optional choice to fast on this day. No, you have begun an obligatory fast. Likewise, the fast must begin at the time of dawn or before the entrance of dawn or as dawn enters. Sorry, to be absolutely precise. As dawn enters, you must begin your fast at that time to make up a day from Ramadan. And remember from last class, we have four reasons why a fast is an obligation. What are those four reasons again? One of them is obviously the month of Ramadan. Then what follows that is what I just mentioned. Making up a day of Ramadan. Both of those kinds of fasts are obligatory. Ada'u Ramadan and Qada'u Ramadan. Making the day of Ramadan in Ramadan and making up a day of Ramadan after Ramadan. That's two out of four. What are the other reasons a fast becomes obligatory? Not an oath, but a vow. Yeah? A vow is to swear by Allah or in Allah's name that you will complete such and such act of worship that's permissible to do. And you put that on yourself as a duty. Yeah? Either mashrut or ghayru mashrut. Either connected to a request that you make. Oh Allah, if you give me a healthy child, then I will fast. Or just I vow unto Allah to fast a day with no connection to any condition. That's called a nadar. Sawmu nadar. Yufuna bin nadri. As Allah Ta'ala has praised the believers that they fulfill their vows. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man nadara an yuti Allah fal yuti'hu. Whoever has made an, a vow to obey Allah, that means with any act of worship that is legislated to be done optionally, then fal yuti'hu, then let him obey Allah. Meaning let him fulfill that vow and obey Allah. وَمَن نَذَرَ أَن يَعْصِيَهُ فَلَا يَعْصِيهِ Then whoever also makes a vow to disobey Allah, I swear by Allah I'm never talking to my mother. I swear by Allah this, you know, sometimes a person makes a vow that is disobedience to Allah. In such a case, kafara, he has to expiate his vow and he cannot fulfill his vow. Naam. So then the third one is, vows made to fast, they must be fulfilled because they are obedience. Fourthly and lastly, hukm of zihar. You guys keep trying to restrict it to one kind of kafara, to one kind of expiation, but it's kafarat. One of them is what I just mentioned. You make a vow to disobey Allah, kafir. One of the options for you to do your kafara is fasting. Fasting because you have said that evil statement, وَإِنَّهُ لَمُنْكَرٌ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا When a man says to his wife that statement which is an evil statement and a statement of falsehood, أَنْتِ عَلَيَّكَ ظَهْرِ أُمِّي You are similar to my mother's backside to me, meaning no more romance, no more interest in the wife, in a, uh, you know, in, a, in a husband and wife type of interest or way then that statement is an evil statement and requires from a man, how much fasting for that one? Shahraini mutatabi'een. Yani two months of fasting, subhanAllah, for that evil statement. Look at one statement and how much expiation can be required from a person to correct that one mistaken statement. We ask Allah Ta'ala for safety from our tongues. Tayyib. So then we can begin the fast of the day of any day in the middle of the day so long as it's not one of these four fasts, the obligatory fasts. So in Ramadan, the intention must be present when? From the entrance of Fajr, right? From the entrance of Fajr. At that time, he must have the intention to fast. The scholars, they discuss the issue of is 
an individual intention required every single day? Or is a general intention for the whole month at the beginning of the month sufficient? And to bring it all together to a simplified answer, a person must have the intention in his heart at the beginning of every fasting day. Whether it's the same intention he had yesterday and it's a continuation of it, or it's a renewed intention every day, however you want to look at it, he has to have a niyyah. He has to have a niyyah because إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Right? Actions are but by their intentions. Nam ya Ibrahim. Exactly what is the intention? We'll deal with that right after the adhan, insha'Allah ta'ala. Let's define and describe what the intention is. Very important. So what exactly is the niyyah? When you say there's an intention required, then what is the niyyah? Do you state something on your lips? No, you don't. No. It is like what Ibrahim mentioned. A man is getting up for suhoor. Why is he getting up for suhoor? Because he has in his heart the intention to fast. He hasn't said anything. Maybe he hasn't said, I'm fasting. But why is he getting up for suhoor? Why is he calling it suhoor? Why is he refraining from food and drink after the entrance of dawn? Why did he eat something right up until dawn? And then when dawn entered, he heard the adhan, he stopped eating and drinking. All of this shows... Aqast, all of it shows that there's something in his heart that he's intending to do. That's the intention. And so it is a bit abstract because it doesn't have a specific body to it. It doesn't have a wording that must be completed like a supplication or the reading of a surah or something. But it is a real thing that must be present in the heart. And a man knows if he's had his intention at the entrance of the day or he hasn't had his intention. The man who wakes up and he goes... After fajr and after sleeping, he wakes up at 10 o'clock in the morning and he says, what? This is a good day for fasting, so I'll fast. He can do that for what kind of fast? Optional. Optional. He can't do that to make up a day in Ramadan. He can't say, I'll make up a day from Ramadan today. It's a good day to fast. No, if he wishes to fast like that, he can do so if it is an optional fast only. Type So then what is the intention? It is the, the azam, the clear intention, the qast. The presence of a commitment, determination, you can say here. These are the words I'm looking for. A commitment, a determination, a restricting of oneself to the rulings that go with fasting. So then the intention is not a statement, it's not a phrase. It is the presence of the goal of fasting and the application of its rulings in the heart at the right time for the length of the legislated time of that act of worship. And that is from the dawn time all the way until the sun sets completely under the horizon, that is the entrance of Maghrib time. What if you're fasting and you've forgotten that you're fasting? Forgetting that you're fasting is different than intending to break the fast in the middle of the day. Get the difference? Intending to break the fast, the fast is over, even if it was just for a moment. Forgetting that you're fasting is sahu, it is forgetfulness, and we're not accountable for it. In fact, the Prophet wasallam taught us that when one of you is fasting and he forgets, and he eats or drinks something, then what? It is only that Allah has given him food and drink. Then he completes his day and he doesn't make that day up. That fast is a valid fast. And barakallahu feek for your question. Our next issue is legitimate excuses for not fasting. And for this... I've given you some notes there. In the third point on the worksheet, you'll notice we have four matters that we'll look at in a little bit of detail here between the Adhan and the Iqama, and we'll end with this. The first of the legitimate excuses for not fasting. Legitimate excuses. Here's a Muslim who has three conditions fulfilled already. Sane mind of age, of puberty or older, and Muslim, not a non-Muslim. So these three things are present. What are the excuses that allow such a Muslim person, male or female, to be excused from fasting? The first one on the list is what, Ya Mustafa? Sickness. Being ill. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Whoever of you is ill or on a journey, then other days are made up. Meaning, and he breaks his fast because of that illness. What's the definition of illness in the book of Allah Ta'ala 
let's say, what's the least of it, so that we know this is an illness which allows me to break my fast, and that's an illness which does not allow me to break my fast. Naam ya Sheikh Sadiq. That's coming up. Right now we're dealing with healthy people normally, but they're sick now. Not the older person who's healthy in a... Well, we'll deal with the issue of being unhealthy in a permanent way too. It says A and B, right? Under the first one? A and B. So we've got two types of illnesses. Before we get to that, what's the definition of the basic illness that a healthy person has that he can be excused from fasting because of it? It is what is known by the customs of the people as an illness. That so-and-so is marid, he's ill. Where do we get that from? It's from itraqu al It's when Allah Ta'ala uses a word and He doesn't provide a definition for it, then it's to be understood as the people would understand that word. Al-urf, it's called al-urf. wal urfu hakim. And the customary understanding of a word is something that actually is part of legislation in Islam. Two words come in this verse that are important like that. One word is marad, illness. The second word is safar, journey. The same idea applies to both. What is the definition of a journey? What is the definition of an illness? It's what the people consider to be an illness or a journey. And they say about this man, he's traveling. They say about this man, he's sick. He is a patient or he's sick. So whatever applies to a person in his culture and in his time that makes him either sick or on a journey, that is the intended meaning of the verse. Urf. Urf. U-R-F. Urf. As Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin said in his poetry about usul, everything that comes in the texts, meaning the texts of the book and the sunnah, and it has not been given a clear definition, a minimum and a maximum and boundaries and you know a definition. Kalhirzi, and he gives an example, like the hirz. Hirz is the Obligatory means through it, property is protected from thieves. And it's a reference to an issue in fiqh that from the conditions of a man losing his hand in an Islamic punishment, in an Islamic court recognized and in place, is that he stole from a procured property. He stole from property that was secured properly based on what that property is. So for example, expensive jewelry a necklace that's worth thousands of dollars, a golden necklace for a lady that's worth thousands of dollars, left at the wudu station. All right, and someone came along and stole it. That thief, while that thief is still blameworthy, that thief will not have his or her hand chopped off in the Islamic judgment because the property wasn't stolen from a secured place. There's a bit of temptation involved there when you have property left out, not secured properly. So a car, a diamond ring, a golden necklace, this different kinds of property, they have different ways that they are to be secured. Right? If you leave your expensive car with the keys in it on the main street and the windows down, and someone steals your car, they're still blameworthy for stealing a car. But they're not going to be judged as a thief whose hand will be chopped off in the Islamic court if there was that level of temptation because of lack of security of the property. So then it has to be stolen from a hirs. Sorry for the long discussion. So what is that hirs? What is that means of protecting property? It's based on the culture of the people for whatever level of property that that is. So like the hirs, whatever is required, whatever word is used in the book and the sunnah to apply to an Islamic ruling, then whatever the people understand in their culture as the definition of that is the intended meaning. And culture is relative to time and place. And it differs. So the travel of today and the travel of a hundred years ago may be different with new ways of technology and so on. One city expands and sort of reaches the limits and the buildings of another city and they become like one city. So now going from this place to that place is no longer considered a travel by the customs of the people. So customs change based on time and place. And the book of Allah Ta'ala was not for Arabia 1400 years ago only. The book of Allah Ta'ala is applicable in every place and in every time until the last day.
And so from that you understand the flexibility of some of the rulings and some of the wordings in the text that they apply to, whatever the culture, whatever the time and place of the people would apply that wording to. Sicknesses can be one of two cases. This is important. They can be permanent illnesses, diseases, that a person is not expected that he's going to recover from it. Allah may do whatever he wills, but based on what we know about people's medical conditions, this kind of illness here, there's not an expectation of recovery from this. It's a permanent condition. In that case, he doesn't make the days up because logically, he's not expected to be healthier later. So then in this case, fidyatun ta'amu miskin. Then he pays a fidya, one half of a saw, one liter and a half of dried food for every day that he doesn't fast, either 29 or 30 days, however long that Ramadan is, he or she pays that to a poor person. He gives out that amount of food to a poor person. It's called a fidya, a sort of like an expiation or a ransom for the fasting that he didn't do. From, again, Surah Al-Baqarah. A poor person with one and a half liters of dry food, staple food, for every day that was in Ramadan, 29 or 30 days. That's when he's incapable of fasting and it's not expected that he's going to recover. The second type of illness is the cold, the flu. A healthy person normally, he's under the weather as they say. He's ill for a time. He's expected to recover from that. So then his case is, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَرٍ Then a number of days from other months will be made up. You make those days up later. The second kind of excused person is based on the list in front of you? Travelers. Travelers. We've discussed it from the same ayah. What's the meaning of traveling? How far do you have to go? It's whatever the people of your time and place consider to be a journey. You bid the people farewell. I'm traveling and so on. When that's the case, then you're traveling and fasting is an option for you. In both cases, it's permissible and allowed for you to fast. Conditionally, that you're not harming yourself. Remember the hadith you heard in the khutbah? That man was fasting on the journey and he fell out. And he said, what's this? The Prophet wasallam asked about it. They said, Sa'im, he's fasting. He said, Laysa min al-birri as fi al-sabr. It's not a form of piety that you fast on a journey. So for someone who's harmed by the illness, the scholars say, haram. It's not permissible for him to fast on a journey. Someone who's not harmed, but it's difficult, they say it's discouraged. Someone who's not harmed at all, during a journey, it's mubah, it's permissible. Sometimes the scholars say it's recommended for him to fast on a journey. For a person who's very healthy and he won't be harmed at all, and he doesn't want to keep track of the days and make them up later. So because it doesn't have any harm on him, it's recommended for him to fast in uh, Ramadan while he's on his journey, so long as there's no hardships and Allahu Ta'ala knows best. So we've got the sick person, the person on a journey, third and fourthly, real quick. Pregnancy and breastfeeding. Nam. Abdullah bin Abbas said the verse, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ The verse that gives us the fidya of feeding a poor person on behalf of every day that one doesn't fast. He said this verse applies to al-hamil wal This verse applies to the pregnant and breastfeeding woman in khafata ala waladayhima. If they fear for the health of their children, when the pregnant or breastfeeding woman fears that this fasting is going to harm the child, then she breaks her fast and she does the fidya. She doesn't make the day up, but rather she pays for one person to be fed for every day of the month of fasting. That's for pregnant or breastfeeding. It may be that the quality of her milk is analyzed and it's shown as very poor quality and the fasting will affect it in a very serious way. So for her, there's the fidya as well. She does not fast while breastfeeding if she's afraid of the baby being harmed by that breast milk. The question is, what about ladies who are pregnant and they have other difficulties, we'll say? Then their case is one of three cases. First case is the one we've described. She fears for the health of the child legitimately. And the doctor has indicated there is a concern here for the health of the child. That's the one we've discussed. Second case, no concern for the child, but she's ill because when women are pregnant, sometimes they're vomiting. Sometimes they feel ill as they go through the pregnancy. Now she's not in fear of any long-term harm or any serious harm for the child. 
but she's not feeling well. She's ill because of some things related to the pregnancy. Then she takes the ruling of a regular sick person. She breaks her fast and makes the day up. Not because of exams, but because of an illness that comes along with pregnancy. Then there's the third case of a woman who's pregnant. Not ill, not traveling, no other thing along with the idea that she's pregnant. And maybe she has exams or other difficulties that are not related to excuses for breaking the fast. And she's required to fast. As she has no excuse for breaking her fast, she's not ill herself. She doesn't fear for the health of the child. She may be facing difficulties. That's not an excuse, a legitimate excuse for breaking the fast. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Naam, so that's the verdict of who? Abdullah ibn Abbas. The pregnant and breastfeeding woman, if she fears for the health of her child, she breaks her fast and she feeds a poor person for every day of the fast. The scholars differ on this issue into a lot of uh, different positions. This is the statement, this is what's correct from the positions attributed to Abdullah bin Abbas and even the narrations attributed back to Abdullah bin Abbas are differing and there is some clashes between them. But this is what is authentic from Abdullah bin Abbas and Allah Ta'ala knows best the last case, the fourth of the four people who are legitimately allowed to break their fast. It is the woman who? She's going through menstruation or postnatal bleeding. Naam. And they, a, a woman came to Aisha radiallahu anha and asked her, why is it that a woman, when she's on her menses, she doesn't pray and she doesn't fast, but she makes up the fast and she doesn't make up the prayer. So when the menses is over, she's got, let's say, seven days of menses, seven times five, 35 prayers. How many of them does she make up? None of them. And she got seven days of Ramadan that she missed. How many of them does she make up? All seven of them. So being that Salat is of a higher level, in terms of the pillars of Islam, it's mentioned before Siyam, it's mentioned before fasting. Why is it that a woman makes up the days of fasting, but not the salat that she missed for the same reason, because she's on her menses. Why is it, Shaykh Sadiq? Why? Why? Allahu A'lam, good answer. This is what Aisha's answer was. Because that's what we were told to do by the Prophet wasallam. This is how Allah is worshipped. If you go into a whole lot of why this and why that, why is the ruku? Why do we bow one time in a rakat and why do we prostrate twice? Why is fajr two rakats only? Why is the four? Because Allah Ta'ala is worshipped like that. Because He sent a messenger to exemplify for us and to teach us how He is to be worshipped with those specific details. There are times when we understand the reason why a certain thing is legislated in a certain way. And there are times when we do not. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, had the deen been based on logical matters, that you understand everything, then we would wipe on the bottoms of the, of the socks and the footwear, and not on the tops. Because that's the place that would be more dirty and more deserving of wiping, had we been left to our intellects and our own rationale. So the deen is not by qiyas, it's not by rationale and analogies. The deen is by ittiba'. It is by following that which has come from Allah Ta'ala and from His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Aisha, when she heard this question from this questioner, she said, A to an anti. Are you a hururiya? Meaning, are you a lady from Hurura, which is a place where the Khawarij first came out? Are you from the Khawarij deviants that challenge the rulings in Islam and you deviate from Islam? And the woman said, La, la, can me ask? I'm just asking. I just want to know. I'm not from that cult that is challenging Islamic rulings, but I just want to ask. And she was a genuine questioner, seeker of knowledge. So Aisha radiallahu anha explained to her, that's what we did in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We were ordered to make up our days of fasting, and we were not ordered to make up our <coughs> prayers after our menses came to an end. So then ladies on their menses and ladies on postnatal bleeding, they are the fourth category of the people who are excused from fasting. This is what Allah Ta'ala has made easy for us to study together this evening. And we'll end at this time sending salat and salam upon the finest of creation, our Prophet Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.